some ragged list like I had reasons for not doing well pennies in my pocket. Could, should, don't, disaster. And if you'll just start the process of change, could, should, and will, you can start this whole process. And if you will, then put it into action. The miracle belongs to you. Jesus said to his disciple, it'll be simple. Go fishing and the first fish you catch, look in his mouth. Peter said, okay, he was used to strange things happening. In this relationship, Peter goes fishing, catches the first fish, looks in his mouth, guess what's in the fish's mouth? Coins. Peter says, wow, coins. <laughs> Starts counting the value of these coins and when he adds it up, guess how much it added up to? Exactly enough money to pay his taxes and Jesus' taxes. Which gives you Jesus' position on taxes. <laughs> Now, we call that what? A miracle, only because we don't quite understand how it works. It doesn't mean it doesn't work. It simply means we don't quite understand how it works. But here's how you get a miracle going for your life. Number one, do what you can. Get a list of the stuff you could do and you haven't done, postpone, and start cleaning that up. You can't start at a better place for personal change. That'll affect your bank account, affect your future, affect your income, affect everything. You can't start a better life change process than cleaning up what you should be doing. The man says, well, my mother lives down in Florida. Should have written her six months ago. I just can't seem to get that letter written. I'm asking you to get that letter written, clean that up, and don't walk like other people walk. Don't postpone like other people postpone. You say, well, is it as simple as writing a letter? And the answer is yes. Where else would you start for life change, personal change? You don't need a pink package to fall out of the sky. You don't need massive bombard pre-conscious, subconscious. Practice channeling, find a 2,000 year gold guru. I mean, you don't need any of that stuff. Pass on all that. Kids are afraid of that stuff. Too much of it, you'll be out on a limb with Shirley. I mean, don't pass on all that stuff. This stuff's too easy, this stuff's too simple. It's called take action, number one, on neglect, on errors, in discipline. Number two, start setting up some disciplines. And if you'll do that, you'll perform a miracle. Now, here's the second part of the miracle. Number one is do what you can. Here's number two, do the best you can. If that's not your philosophy, I would ask you to amend it. Let me give you the best of ancient script. Here's what it says. Whatever your hands find to do, do it with all your might, do it with all your strength, and do it with all your power. What a good philosophy. That kind of philosophy revolutionize your life if you haven't picked it up lately. Guy slips in late, company doesn't seem to mind, slips out early, first one in the parking lot, heading for happy hour. Stretches his break, comes early for lunch, late back from lunch, company doesn't seem to notice. Guy says, best as I can calculate, I'm putting in about a half a day's work and I'm collecting a full day's pay. And the guy says, I got it made. Little does he know the seeds of his own disaster are already being sown by the weakness of his own personal philosophy. It's not the economy that's going to determine your next six years. It's your philosophy about labor and about activity and about miracle and soil and seed and sunshine and rain and the economy and the banks and the money and the companies and the schools and what's going on. It's your philosophy and your attitude and then your ability to take action. All of that we call the process of life change, miracle working. Number one, do what you can. Number two, do the best you can. Here was number four. Results. Results. Every once in a while, you got to take a measure, see how you're doing with these three pieces, philosophy, attitude, activity. Now we take a measure called results. What is the results at the end of the day, the results at the end of the week? You can't let too much time go by without checking. When time goes by, six years I'd been out there working when I met my teacher, Mr. Schilf. Schilf said, well, Mr. Rohn, let's just go through a little summary here. He said, in the last six years, how much money have you saved and invested? Let's go through a little tab list here. How much money have you saved and invested the last six years? I said, what? 
Zero. He said, you have messed up. You remember these notes. I like that. You've messed up. He said, who sold you on that plan? I thought, my gosh, the man's right. I'm a nice guy. I bought the wrong plan. What if you were 50 and broke? Right? Didn't need to change countries. Bought the wrong plan. What a sad scenario that would be. But Shelf said these questions. Let's go through some results. He said, how many books have you read in the last 90 days? I said, what? Zero. Wisdom of the world available? Change your life, change your future? Wisdom of the world available? Develop, develop any skill you want? Earn the kind of income you want? Have all the treasures you want, equities you want, relationship with your family that you want, everything that you want available, and the wisdom of the world to help you get it? Haven't read any books in the last 90 days. My teacher said, Mr. Rohn, you have messed up. I'm telling you, you've got the deal. Shelf said, Mr. Rohn, in the last six months, how many classes have you taken to improve your skills or to develop new skills? Go for the American dream. Become rich and powerful and sophisticated and healthy and influential. How many classes have you taken in the last six months? I said, how many? Zero. He said, you have messed up. He said, you don't need to unmess the country. You don't need to straighten out the perplexed. You don't need to straighten out any of this stuff. All you've got to do is look within and let results teach you a great deal about your own activity, your own attitude, and your own philosophy. I went through that process. Take this phrase home. Results is the name of the game. What other game is there? Results. Here's all life asks us to do. Make measurable progress in reasonable time. Just take home that little phrase. Good phrase. We're asked in life simply to make measurable progress in reasonable time. We demand it of our children. How many years do you want your child to spend in fourth grade? <laughs> Approximately. <laughs> About one. If it looks like they're not going to make it, we pour on the pressure. Call legitimate pressure. Lack of results. Peer pressure, family pressure, school pressure, community pressure. Every other kind of pressure we can bring to bear. Why? You can't stay more than one year in fourth grade. As parents, you'd have to leave the community. You say, well, what if they're nice kids? Wouldn't you give them three or four years? And the answer is no. You've got to make better progress than that. So you've got to check fairly often. Some things you've got to check every day. Some things you've got to check at least by the end of the week. Salesman joins this little sales company. He's supposed to make 10 calls first week. Wouldn't it be legitimate? Call him in on Friday and say, John, what? How many calls? I mean, this stuff is simple. John says, well, say, John, well won't fit in this little box here. Well. <laughs> now John starts with a story. You say, John, I made this little box so small so a story won't fit. <laughs> I don't need a story. I need what? A number. A number. What will a number tell me? everything. John's supposed to make 10 calls. What if he made 20? You say, wow, wow, we got somebody. What if he only made one call? Whoa. <laughs> Will that tell us something about John's philosophy? And the answer is yes. Will it tell us something about his attitude? Of course. Will it tell us something about his disciplines? Of course. And if he wants a lesson in life change. All he has to do is be willing to face the numbers and come up with the results that will teach you to either celebrate if you got good results or fix whatever needs to be fixed in your philosophy, attitude, activity called disciplines. You don't need to go anywhere else. I do believe in affirmations. And they are valuable as long as you affirm the truth. Because it says in ancient scripts, the truth will set you free. Free to do what? Amend your errors and pick up new disciplines. That's what the truth is for, to help us amend our errors and pick up the disciplines for life change. That's what the truth is for. So I do believe in affirming the truth. 
If you're broke, the best thing to affirm is, I am broke. You put that up on the refrigerator where you can see it every day. I mean, that's how you do that. Now, if you need a little additional affirmation, you just put up there, I'm 40 and broke. I mean, you know, that ought to do it. And if you need just a little more, put up there, I live in America and I'm 40 and broke. That's enough to turn your life around. It says, hey, something is wrong. Somewhere I have messed up. And I'm telling you, if you'll start with that, it's called the process of life change. And it doesn't matter how small the process is to start. One discipline starts it, and then one discipline feeds another, feeds another. And the first thing you know, you've got this whole cycle in an upward positive motion. And it's called life change. It's called income change. It's called health change. Relationship with your family change. Equities unprecedented that you can have in numbers that will stagger the imagination if you do not curse what's available and start amending what's possible to get the results that you want. I don't think I can put it in any better language. That's it. Kids can do it. Teenagers can do it. Parents can do it. Managers can do it. Right? Government officials can do it. Anybody can do it. Anybody can do this stuff called personal change. Wow. Results is the name of the game. Success is a numbers game. Good note to make. Success is a numbers game. You got to go for the numbers. You got to understand what the numbers are. How many pounds overweight should you be at age 50? Approximate. John says, I got big bones. We'll give you 10 pounds. 10 pounds for big bones. Otherwise, come on, John. 20 pounds, 25 pounds. Shouldn't we turn on the caution light at work and at home? Blinking caution lights. And this is what's that caution light. So John's up about 20, 25 pounds. We got the blinking light going at home. Got to go in here at work. To remind him what? Wrong numbers. Okay. 35, 40 pounds, red light. Blinking at home. Somebody says, what's that blinking red light? Say, John's up about 40 pounds. <laughs> 50 pounds. We got the siren. Ah, 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 ah. What's that siren at home and at work? John's up about 50 pounds. <laughs> Cholesterol, almost out of control. Come on. Success is a numbers game. I'm asking you to be mature enough to start checking your own numbers. How many books have you read in the last 90 days? Transform your life. Become cultured, powerful, sophisticated, healthy, influential, all the rest of the stuff you want. How many books? How many classes? How committed are you to taking what's available? and turning it into equities unprecedented since we live in a country that there's been no such country in the last six and a half thousand years. If you'll pick up that process, ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you, it's called life change of the best order. Now here's the last one. Number five is called lifestyle. Lifestyle is simply learning how to live well. The last of the five major pieces. Here's the ultimate challenge of life. I've worked on this, you cannot believe how hard, since age 25. And that is, after applying better philosophy, attitude, and, res and activity, and picking now up results, what are results for? Here's my ultimate challenge on results. To fashion, good word to jot down, fashion, Fashion for yourself lifestyle, or what we call the good life. That's the ultimate challenge, to take your results, take your money, take your results, take the return, take the equities you've gathered, and now fashion for yourself a good life, like weaving a tapestry. And Mr. Shelf gave me all kinds of examples on lifestyle. He gave me two phrases that helped change my life. In case you have to leave early, let me give you these two phrases. It'll be worth the price of coming and being here today. Just take these two phrases home in case you have to leave early. Here's number one. Shelf said, Mr. Owen, if you wish to be wealthy, study wealth. When he said that, I said, my gosh, 
I don't know anybody that studies wealth. Where am I going to learn it? He said, never mind, Mr. Owen, now that you've met me, if you'll be with me for a while, he said, and if you'll commit yourself, he said, I will teach you. And he taught me. He taught me the books. He taught me the stuff. Changed my life. By the time I was 31, I was a millionaire. The man taught me well. If you wish to be wealthy, study wealth. If you were to show me your present economic plan, in a personal conversation between you and me, you say, Mr. Owen, let me disclose for you my current economic financial plan for the future. Would I get so excited, I'd say, hey, I'm going to go across the country and lecture on your plan. <laughs> and if the answer is no, Mr. Owen, you probably wouldn't want to go across the country and lecture on my plan. Here's my question to you. Why not? Why wouldn't you have a superior, powerful financial plan that's taking you to the places you want to go? I'm asking you if you find yourself caught like I was at age 25, make the personal commitment today and say, I'm going to study and I'm going to change. And five years from now, nobody's going to be able to say, how come you don't have a superior plan living in a superior country with superior opportunity? Nobody's going to be able to say that five years from now of me. If you'll make that commitment, I'm telling you, this will be one of the most exciting days of your life. Not because of my seminar. It'll be one of the most exciting days of your life because of your commitment to this simple little process I've outlined for you. Here was the second phrase. Mr. Schoff said, Mr. Owen, if you wish to be happy, study happiness. I didn't know happiness was a study. My best hope for happiness at age 25 was to just go through the day with my fingers crossed. Open somehow, something would make me happy. Shelf said, no, Mr. Rohn, happiness is not something you postpone. Happiness is not something off in the future. Happiness is something you design. You've got to get the word. Happiness is something you design. Happiness is a study. Happiness is a practice. Happiness is an art. It's not an accident. It's an art. And anybody that wants to can study, practice the art, happy living. Happiness is like culture. Money doesn't make you cultured, but culture is within the grasp of all of us. How much is a book on sophistication in the marketplace? $4,000? No, $40. I'm telling you, in America, everything's available. Everything's within reach. All you have to be is committed to it and make it a study. Culture is a study. Sophistication is a study. It's not an amount. It's not an account. It's a study. Money doesn't make you sophisticated and cultured. I know a guy that's rich. He's a clod. <laughs> the guy's a clod. He eats with his elbow in his soup. I mean, he's just a clod. Nothing much more pitiful than a rich clod. I mean, you know, it's a sad thing to see. Money doesn't make you sophisticated. Only study and practice makes you sophisticated. Only study and practice makes you cultured. And only study and practice makes you happy. Study and practice makes you rich key phrase. Don't be lazy in learning. One, how to do well. Next, how to live well. Don't be lazy in learning and practicing the art of economics, practicing the art of productivity, and practicing the art of lifestyle. Shove taught me in such simple terms. Shove said, Mr. Owen, if you're getting your shoes shined, shoe shine boy has done an exceptional job. You look down, you got one of the world's all-time great shines. And you pay him. Now, you got a little change in your hand. Question pops in your mind. Should I give him one quarter or two quarters as a tip from a neat shine? Here's what Schoff said. If two amounts pop in your mind, always go for the higher amount and become the higher thinking person. That helped change my life. Here's what he said. Become a two-quarter person. Now, you can tell that was a long time ago when a quarter was a good tip. Now it takes dollars. But just substitute 1992 dollars for quarters. Show said, hey, if you 
you know, are thinking one quarter or two quarters, and you say, well, no, I'll just give him one quarter. He said, that'll affect you the rest of the day. The rest of the day, you'll look down, see this great shine, you'll say, I gotta be really cheap. One lousy quarter, tip from a shine. But he said, if you'll go for the two quarters, Shop said, you can't believe the extra happiness you can buy for just an extra quarter. That's called studying and practicing the art of lifestyle, which means living well. Money doesn't make you happy. Father wads up a $20 bill, throws it at his son, and says, if you need the darn stuff that bad, take it, just get out of my face. How sad, a father with money and no joy. He studied economics, but he never studied joy. I'm asking you to turn that around. Turn that all around. I did a seminar one time, St. Louis, Missouri. When I finished a seminar like this, man walked up and said, Mr. Owen, you've really gotten to me. He said, I'm going to change my philosophy. I'm going to change my attitude. I'm going to change my life. I'm going to change everything. He said, you've touched me today. And he said, you'll hear about me. You'll hear my story someday. I said, okay. Right? A lot of people right, say things. Sure enough, a few months later, I come back to St. Louis, did another seminar. When I finished my seminar, I saw this man come walking up. I didn't remember his name, but he said, I'm sure you'll remember me as the man who said, I'm going to go make some changes. You've touched me today. I said, I do remember you. He said, I'm telling you, things are already happening for me. I cannot believe in just a matter of months. He said, one of the things I decided to change was my relationship with my family. He said, my wife and I have two lovely teenage daughters. Parents couldn't ask for any more beautiful, lovely daughters. And he said, I'm the only one that's given them trouble. He said, these daughters of ours have never given us any trouble. He said, I've usually been the one all these years, given all the trouble and all the static. He said, my daughters love to go to the rock concerts, and I'm always giving them trouble. They have to beg me for the money. He said, I don't want you to go. You stay out too late. The music's too loud. You're going to ruin your hearing. You won't be able to hear the rest of your life. And he said, I just get on their case. And he said, they keep begging, keep begging. Finally, when they beg long enough, I say, all right, here's the money. If you have to go that bad, just go. He said, that's how I've been up until now. But he said, after I left your seminar, I decided to change all that called lifestyle, living well. He said, you won't believe it. Not long ago, I picked up the newspaper and I saw an advertisement and I knew my two daughters, it was one of their favorite performers, was coming to town. He said, guess what I did? He said, I went down and bought the tickets myself and brought them home, put them in an envelope. And when I saw my daughters later that day, he said, I handed them this envelope and I said to my two lovely daughters, you may not believe it, but inside this envelope are two tickets for the upcoming concert. They could not believe. And he also added, you'll be happy to know begging days are over. <laughs> now they cannot. <laughs> he said, now don't open the envelope till you get to the concert. They said, okay. So they go to the concert come concert time, open up the envelope, hand the tickets to the usher. He says, follow me. And he starts down front. The girls say, hey, hold it, hold it. Something must be wrong. He takes another look, says, no, nothing's wrong, follow me. Tenth row, center. Now they cannot leave. <laughs> Tenth row, center. The only tickets they were able, able you know, ever to beg for was, right, third balcony, can't see. He said, I stayed up a little late that night, sure enough, a little after midnight, my two daughters come bursting through the front door. One of them lands in my lap. The other one's got her arms around my neck. They're both saying, you got to be one of the all-time world's great fathers. He said, Mr. Owen, you're right. I can't believe. Same money, different father. He said, I've started making the changes and I decided to start with my teenagers, my girls. He said, what a difference it's making in my life. And I'm telling you, you can do that with your lifestyle. You can do it with your sales career. You can do it with your management career. You can do it with any part of your life. If you're looking for equities unmatched, do not curse the only thing you have. Don't complain about the only thing you have, which is seed and soil, sunshine, rain, miracle and seasons. But start changing and processing and evaluating things like we're covering today. And this process of change will take off for you. You will not believe what can happen in such a short period.
Next subject, personal development. Some of the things Mr. Shove taught me starting at age 25, some things came quickly, some things came easily, setting goals, that was easy. We're gonna talk about that uh, later on. But this one I had to struggle with, personal development. It was hard for me to give up my old blame list. It was so comfortable blaming the government and blaming my negative relatives and the company, company policy, unions, wage scale, economy, interest rates prices and circumstances and all that. That was difficult for me to give up. That was quite a transition for me to make and blaming myself. But Mr. Shove started out with something very, very important. Let me give that to you. He said, it's not what happens that determines the major part of your future. It's not what happens. What happens happens to us all. He said, the key is what you do about it. It's not what happens, it's what you do about it. And he said, if you will start that process of change, do something different the next 90 days than you did the last 90 days, like picking up the books to read. Do something different like the new health disciplines, relationship with your family, whatever it is, doesn't matter how small it is. If you'll start doing different things with the same circumstances since we cannot change the circumstances but we can change ourselves we can change what we do and then he gave me another secret to success when he said what you have at the moment mr own you've attracted by the person you've become what you have at the moment you've attracted by the person you've become few little simple principles here. Once you understand these, it starts to explain so much. Now, sometimes it's a little tough to take blaming yourself instead of the marketplace, taking responsibility instead of putting it off on someone else. Those, that transition sometimes is a challenging mission. And this one was a little tough for me. He said, Mr. So let's talk a little bit about personal development, that extraordinary adventure I undertook starting at age 25. And I've never ceased that adventure. I'm still going for it in the 90s. I want to get better and better. I want my craft to get better, my business operations to get better, the things I do to get better. Because once I picked up this simple formula, I'm telling you it's easy to figure out where the problem is if you go to work on it. Now let's talk about personal development. And in helping kids understand personal development, I always start with money. Now, money's not the only place to start. Money certainly isn't the only value, but we've all got to start somewhere. And money's something you can count, right? Kids are interested in money, okay? A lot of things are a little tougher to measure, but economics is pretty easy, right? Because you can count, okay? Somebody says, how are you doing? You say, I don't know, let's count. Now, this is not the only count. I understand that. There's a lot of other things to count. But to see if there may be some errors in your judgment and lack of disciplines in your life, we might as well start with money. Because it's so easy to count. So let's just start there and see whether or not maybe we have messed up. Okay. So here's how I explain it to kids. We get paid for bringing value to the marketplace. Key to understanding economics. We get paid for bringing value to the marketplace. Marketplace is also described as reality. Reality, the marketplace. 
Now, it takes time. It takes time to bring value to the marketplace, but we don't get paid for time. It's very important for kids to understand, as well as adults. We don't get paid for time. Mistakenly, the man says, well, I'm making about $20 for an hour. Not true. Not true. If that was true, you could just stay home, have them send your money. No, it's not true. You don't get paid for the hour. You get paid for the value you put in the time. So we don't get paid for time, we get paid for value. Now, since that's true, here's one of the key questions of the afternoon. Is it possible to become twice as valuable and make twice as much money in the same time? Is it possible to become three times as valuable as you now are and make three times as much money in the same time? Is that possible? Of course. If you want to really emphasize something, that's a good phrase for it. Of course. Of course. Okay. Now, all you have to do to earn more money in the same time is simply become more valuable. America's unique. It's a ladder to climb. It starts down here, what? About $4 an hour? Big argument last year in Congress about the starting place. Should be five, should be five, should be five. Well, no, it doesn't need to be five. Why not start with four? It's a ladder. Right, this is not a bed. This is a ladder. This is a ladder to climb. Starts at four dollars. Now somebody says, well, should be five, should be five. Well, maybe. If you're gonna stay at the bottom for the rest of your life, it probably should be five. But that's kind of a pitiful way to live. Start and not grow. Start and not change. Start and not become more valuable. Hey, the whole scenario of life is to start, number one, and what? Become more valuable, number two. So America is a ladder to climb. Starts at $4 an hour, and the more valuable you become, you just keep moving up the ladder. Top income last year, what, 52 million? Guy that runs Disney? Would a company pay somebody for one year's work $52 million? And the answer is, of course. This is one of those of course places. Of course. If you help a company make a billion dollars, would they pay you 52 million? The answer is, of course, it's chicken feed. I mean, it's not much money. Now, why that much money? Because he has become so valuable. Now, why would we pay somebody only $4 an hour? They're not very valuable to the marketplace. Now, we gotta make that distinction to the marketplace. Might be a valuable brother, a valuable member of the community, valuable member of the church, valuable member in the sight of God, to the human family, of course, those kind of values. But to the marketplace, which is called what? Reality. Reality is, if you're not very valuable, you don't get much money. Those are called the facts. I mean, that's how that is. Well, then how do you get more money? Simple answer. Somebody says, well, I'll go on strike for more. Well, here's a major problem with that. Here's a major problem with that. You can't get rich by demand. Somebody says, well, I'm waiting for a raise. I'm telling you it's easier to climb than to wait for a raise. Why not just become more valuable rather than wait? I'm telling you that's the key to all good things. Becoming more valuable. Why would we pay somebody $400 an hour? They've become more valuable to the marketplace. See how this works? I'm telling you this stuff is so easy. This is America. This is a ladder. How far is it from four to five? I'm telling you, it's not far. Four to five dollars an hour? If you work for McDonald's, haul out the trash, they'll pay you five dollars an hour. If you whistle while you haul out the trash, they'll pay you five dollars an hour, I'm telling you. You'll get an extra dollar just for a good attitude. Yay, McDonald's. Wear the hat. It's incredible. 
five dollars and then you just keep becoming more valuable more valuable more valuable I got a telephone call five years ago the company said we're ready to expand internationally we need some help I was sort of semi-retired right looking for the next exotic beach they said no no mr. Rohn we got a project for you right gonna expand internationally we could use your help next little while we'll add a some millions to your fortune make it worth your while I said okay <laughs> I thought later isn't that interesting that they called me my second thought was of course they'd call me who else would they call I mean you know <laughs> I can get the job done now how come how come I got a telephone call worth millions I had become valuable now I'm a farm boy from Idaho I was raised in obscurity one year of college and I thought I was thoroughly educated made all kinds of mistakes galore at age 25 the creditors are calling me saying hey you told us the check was in the mail I got pennies in my pocket I got nothing in the bank I'm behind on my promises how come I get a telephone call five years ago and it's worth millions I changed I changed I turned my life around is it possible to become worth millions speaking economically now there's a lot of values to become but let's just talk economics is it possible to become that valuable the answer is of course of course now let me give you the secret show said here's the secret mr. Rohn learn to work harder on yourself than you do on your job once I got that it turned my life around learn to work harder on yourself than you do on your job He said, if you work hard on your job, you'll make a living. If you work hard on yourself, you can make a fortune. If you would have known me at age 25, you would have said, Jim Rohn's a hard worker. If you'd have known me, you'd have said that. I'm the guy, I don't mind coming a little bit early, staying a little bit late, I don't mind that. You'd have said, well, Jim Rohn's a hard worker. You say, well, how come he's got pennies in his pocket and nothing in the bank and behind on his promises? Well, I was a hard worker, but I was working hard on my job, not on my self. I'm telling you, if you'll learn that simple little principle and start the process today, latest tomorrow, I'll give you tonight to think it over. <laughs> and start this whole process of personal development, work on yourself, make yourself more valuable to the marketplace I'm telling you you can so dynamically change your income and economics is the least of the values that you can start earning in terms of equity if you'll start working harder on yourself than you do on your job work hard on yourself and develop the skills work hard on yourself and develop the graces all of the stuff necessary to become more valuable to the marketplace I'm telling you your whole life can explode into change promotions no problem becoming more valuable to the company I'm telling you no problem money no problem economics no problem future no problem if you just go to work on the right thing not get things out there to change don't try to change the seed don't change the soil don't change the sunshine don't change the rain don't change the mix of seasons let the miracle of everything that's available work for you and start working on the inside work on your philosophy work on your attitude work on your personality work on your language work on the gift of communication work on all of your abilities and if you'll start making those personal changes I'm telling you everything will change for you now let me give you another scenario on personal development it's called the four major lessons in life to learn before we get to the four major lessons in life to learn let me give you a key phrase for your notes here it is life and business is like the seasons life and business is like the seasons. Frank Sinatra sings, life is like the seasons. Now here's one of the key phrases that changed my life. Starting at age 25, you can see this whole scenario. Personal development for me began. I've never been the same since. Here's the next key phrase. You cannot change the seasons, but you can change yourself. You can't change the seasons. But you can change yourself. My best hope, right? When I'm 25 years old, my best hope was to go through the day with my fingers crossed saying, I sure hope things will change. 
I sure hope things will change. It seemed to be my only way for my life to get better if things would change. Here's what I discovered. It isn't going to change. It isn't going to change. I did a seminar one time for Standard Oil executives and management in Honolulu, now known as Chevron. And we're talking economics one day around the conference table. And one of them said to me, Mr. Rohn, you know some fairly important people around the world. You have a chance to travel internationally. Can you tell us what you think the 80s are going to be like? Now you can tell how far back this goes. He said, what do you think the 80s are going to be like? And I thought for a moment and I said, gentlemen, I do know the right people. And I do have some experience. I think I can tell you. So they all leaned in a little closer and I said, gentlemen, based on the people I know and based on the best of my own experience, I think in the 80s it's going to be about like it's always been. <laughs> Aren't you glad you came today? I mean, that's inside stuff. I don't just spread that around everywhere. It's going to be about like it's always been. It isn't going to change. To hope that it'll change is called whistling in the wind, being so naive, hoping for something that isn't going to occur. I can give you the shortest history lesson that you can imagine in one sentence. What describes human history on the spinning planet the last six and a half thousand years? Let me describe it for you in one sentence. Here's human history in one sentence. Opportunity mixed with difficulty. That's about as simple as you can put it. And opportunity mixed with difficulty isn't going to change. The man says, well, if it isn't going to change for the future, if it isn't going to change in the 90s, how will my life ever change? Answer, when you change. And if you will change, everything will change for you. Your bank account will change, your income will change, your future will change. The ability to acquire your dreams will change. It'll all change if you will change. And now let's go through the scenario of the seasons. Life and business is like the seasons. Let's cover them. Here's number one, major lesson in life to learn. Learn how to handle the winters. You say, well, Mr. Rohn, a lot of this stuff is fairly obvious. That's true. Just need somebody like me just to come along and remind us. This is what this is called today, a reminding session. I got no new truth for you to discover. This is all old stuff. We just need to hear it again. Somebody get on our case a little bit, right? We all need that. Here's number one lesson. Learn how to handle the winters. That's obvious. The winters come right after falls. And pray tell how often. Every year, according to written history, for the last six and a half thousand. To cross your fingers and say, I hope, I hope, I hope it doesn't come. I'm telling you, we call that naive. <laughs> now, there's all kinds of winters. Not just the winter of the season. But there's all kinds of winters. Winter time. The down time. The discouraging time. One writer called it the winter of discontent. The winter when you can't figure it out, the winter when it all goes wrong. Economic winters, social winters, political winters, and personal winters. When your heart is smashed in a thousand pieces, the nights are unusually long. It's called winter time. Barbara Streisand sings, it used to be so natural to talk about forever, but used to be's don't count anymore. They just lay on the floor till we sweep them away. You don't sing me love songs. You don't say you need me, and you don't bring me flowers anymore. A song of winter. But hey, we're acquainted with all those winter scenarios. We've been through them all. Now the question is, what do you do about the winters? Well, you can't get rid of January by tearing it off the calendar. But here's what you can do with the upcoming winters of your life. The long ones, the short ones, the easy ones, the more difficult ones. Here's what you can do. Get wiser and stronger and better. Just make a list of that trio of good words, wiser, stronger, and better. To challenge for yourself the upcoming winters of your life, don't you think you could read more? Pick up the scenario, pick up the books, pick up the cassettes. So I would put some stuff on cassettes so you can listen to it, put it in books so you can read it. Now putting it on video so you can see it. I'm telling you, anybody that wants to can get wiser. Next is stronger. Anybody can get stronger. If you're willing to do the push-ups, you can get stronger. If you're willing to put yourself through the paces, you can get stronger. Can you develop stronger skills? And the answer is yes. Start practicing, practicing, practicing. And you can get stronger. Can you get stronger in handling life situations? Of course. 
But you've got to go to work on yourself. You can't blame out there wishing it was easier. Wish you were stronger. And here's the last one, get better. Anybody can get better. Language, we can all get better. I've been lecturing now for 33 years, and I'm telling you, today versus 33 years ago, I'm better. First time I gave a talk, I stood up, my mind sat back down. I mean, you know, I've been through that whole deal. <laughs> Opened my mouth, nothing came out for a while. My knees are banging together, the sweat's pouring off my face, I'm shaking like a leaf. It's called terror, in case you haven't tried it. It was first attempts. But I'm telling you, I got through it, and I did it again, and I got through it, and I did it again, and I got through it. And now, of course, I can lecture for a few hours in one day. Anybody can get better, develop the skills, okay? Handle the upcoming winters. Don't wish away the winters. That's called naive. Wish for the skills. Wish for the strength. Wish for the wisdom. Here's the second major lesson in life to learn. Learn how to take advantage of the spring. Uniquely enough, spring follows winter. And pray tell how often? Six and a half thousand times. I mean, those are good odds. I'd gamble on it one more time. I mean, those are good odds. Every time, you can't beat those odds. Spring is called opportunity. Another day is called opportunity. Days follow nights. How about that? And how often? Every day. But now here's what we must learn to do with opportunity. Underline two strategic words in that sentence. Take advantage. Just, sp the, uh, just because spring comes is no sign you're going to look good in the fall. You got to take advantage of it. You got to do something with it. Read every book you can on what to do with your springs, what to do with your opportunities, what to do with your days, what to do with your chances. Don't miss the educational process. Don't miss the process of learning to understand opportunity keeps coming, but the key is taking advantage, taking advantage. Everybody in this room's got to learn to do one of two things, plant in the spring or beg in the fall. And it doesn't mean you can't become a sophisticated beggar but you don't need the reputation. Learn to plant in the spring, take advantage. And there's an urgency here on springtime because there's just a few springs, handful of springs offered to each of us. So take advantage swiftly and quickly. Don't just let the time pass. The Beatles wrote, life is very short. And for John Lennon, it was extra short. For Michael Landon, it was extra short but life is short at the longest it's short so don't just let the springs pass 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 take advantage seize the day seize the moment seize the opportunity that's the key springtime life is fragile life is brief elton john sings she lived her life like a candle in the wind it's fragile, it's brief. Whatever you're going to do, you've got to get at it. Don't just let it pass away. Here's major lesson number three. In the summer, learn how to nourish and protect. We've got two challenges in the summer, in the personal development part of our life. And that is become capable and powerful enough in the summer and wise enough in the summer to nourish what's good and defend yourself against what's bad. Nourish and defend. The summertime is an interesting time. It holds the possibility of the promise of harvest time, but it also has the possibility of the threat. Sure enough, as soon as you've planted your garden, the busy bugs and the noxious weeds are out to take it. And let me give you another word of advice. They will take it unless you prevent it. Summertime is an interesting time. Best as I can describe summertime, you've got to nourish your values like a mother. Nourish like a mother. Go after the threat to the values you've got like a father. Deal with the weeds. Kill the weeds. Nourish the garden and kill the weeds. That's called summertime. What a challenging time. 
Give life like a mother. Take life like a father. Summertime. You've got to deal with the negative as well as the positive. Summertime is a unique, complex mix of positive and negative. Opportunity and threat. What a scenario of life itself. Opportunity and threat to the opportunity. And you've got to deal with both. You've got to think positive and you've got to think negative. You've got to